Shalom, shalom, Mishpaka. This is your Yao checking in. Um, forgive my hair, too. I did get a haircut, but forgive my hair. I've been wearing a ponytail all day, and it's got my hair standing up in weird ways. But <clears throat> I'm not here to talk about my hair. I'm here to talk about the prevalence of false doctrine online, which is enough to drive you crazy. Enough to drive you crazy, right? So the, the false doctrine that, you know, has most recently uh, got me tripping. And I mean, this is an old, old, old false doctrine. This has been around since, you know, since I came into this, to this walk. Uh, that white people are Edomites, right? That the Ashkenazim are Edomites. That anybody that you don't like <laughs> are Edomites, right? Particularly white people. And we've made a couple videos about this already. And it just, you know, I mean, I don't expect these videos to get any impact on anybody because there's only like, <laughs> 20 people that's been watching these videos but at least those 20 people can go out and have the information to correctly identify who these people are and what's going on in the world around you because it's the most amazing thing right it really just points deeper into biblical prophecy than the mainstream narrative would want you to believe right this Edomite white people doctrine is written, is a, is a fabricated doctrine that has been given to these Israelite camps in order to propagate nonsense, right? And to make people look crazy, to make people look hypocritical, right? That's how you know that these doctrines are designed because they're designed with very glaring flaws. And these glaring flaws are, you know, noticeable and conspicuous enough as to make the person who believes them into a fool, right? <laughs> so, you know, not to just toss around the word fool lightly, but there's no other way to describe it if you're prop propagating a false doctrine that is easily proven false. Do you understand what I mean? You know, people can have doctrines that are difficult, right? Some doctrines are difficult, difficult to understand. And you can understand as to why people would hold to these doctrines because of the way that the world is, because of the way that society is, because that is it's very hard to get around some of these things. For, in, for instance, if you grew up like I grew up, you grew up believing that Jews were white, right? That the people who were Jewish wore the funny hats, like the top hats, and they had the little curly cues down the side of their head, and they wore these big black coats, and they walked around singing, oh, 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 like that, right? And we never knew that they were Russians. <laughs> we thought that that's what a Jew was, right? And if we really were to try to single and put a finger on, I mean, and I can only speak for myself, and I can kind of speak for the people that I grew up with because trust me, this wasn't a conversation in any community that I've ever been a part of. Um, but we did not know the importance of those people, right? We didn't know that the Bible was based on who is and who isn't a Jew, right? We never did know that. We, we knew that Jesus was Jewish, and we knew that Jewish people were the chosen people of God, quote-unquote, but we also knew that if you believed in Jesus, that makes you a chosen person of God. And we also knew that that was about 2 billion people that believed in Jesus. Like, 
as far as you know my world was a hundred percent of the people in my world believed in Jesus which meant we were you know if we were not Jewish we were as Jewish right that's what it meant it meant that Christianity and Christians were the real chosen people and the Jews were just a stepping stone to get to Christianity right and those you know those poor Jews just had to realize that one day that's what I grew up believing that's what I was taught that's what I saw right that's what I saw in in reality was that Jewish people were white Jesus was white all of history was white right that's what we saw and so if this is what you still believe today that's an understandable false doctrine to be in because the entire world is based around this false doctrine and every book that you open will have Jesus in it as being white every program that you see on TV will have Moses as being white every uh, person that you meet on the street that is of Jewish or Israeli ancestry will be white so not only is the false doctrine prevalent but it'll also be strengthened by everything you see right everything you see in reality will corroborate this false doctrine right now once you wake up and recognize that this is not the reality of ancient history it's a shock to the system it's a jolt to the system that you know just wakes you up out of this deep 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 slumber of white supremacy right you know we always were raised believing that jesus was black and there was no evidence there's no bible verses no you know historical documentation to prove this you know it was just the rumor in the community oh y'all ain't no jesus is black and people and people love to say that but you know it was like an anecdote right because there was no i hope i'm using that word right anecdote um because there was no real proof for that to be the case it's just something that people said and it's not something that i would ever repeat because you know as a kid i really wanted to be able to know and prove what i said before i just went around saying it so and then the other thing is it didn't supposedly it didn't matter if jesus was black because he died for our sins and he didn't die for just my sins he died for everybody's sins so then what does it matter what color he was or not as long as i'm saved that should be the only thing that matters and wow that's a powerful doctrine right that you know enough to blow the socks off of anybody black anybody white chinese mexican whatever you are um and <laughs> the truth is far more powerful than that do you see what i'm saying um, but my whole purpose in going down that line of reasoning is to say that the people that do hold this doctrine, that doctrine that, you know, Jesus is white and that, you know, the race of Jesus, even if he's not white, doesn't matter. You know, that's an understandable false doctrine to have. Now, again, once you wake up to what the real truth is, um, it's it's fascinating how it happens. Right, the real truth is that the old world was the old black world, that everybody in the old world was black or shades thereof. The Romans were not white people, or at least not white like you see white people today. They were lighter skinned than the Hebrews, but they were not white. If you see a Mexican, would you say that they're white? I mean, they may, some of them may think they're white, but no, you wouldn't, you wouldn't say that they were white. If you see somebody from Iraq, would you say that they're white? No, you wouldn't necessarily, they're closer than the Mexicans, I'll tell you that, but you wouldn't say that they were necessarily white. You'd say that they have some, some color and, and then you'd say that they have dark hair or whatever, and that they were something other than white. 
Well, that's how the Romans looked. That's how the Greeks looked. They did not look white. They didn't. You know, they come from Yapith. So they have Yapithite characteristics, um, but not in the way that that we would assume that they would be today, right? So, so let's get back on what we're talking about here as Edom being the white man. So the doctrine, the false doctrine is, is that, did I say that right? The false doctrine is that Edom, who is the twin brother of Jacob, who is Israel, was white, right? And that you had this, <laughs> and I've seen the meme for this, it's just utterly ridiculous. <laughs> that you have this, you know, from Isaac uh, and Rebecca, um, that you have these set of twins, that one twin was white and the other twin was black, right? And then they always depict the white twin as having red hair because he's called Red, right? That was his nickname, Red, right? And that's why his people, the Dukes of Edom, are called Edomites and not Esauites because his name at some point was Red, you know, Adam. Edom is the same word as Adam, which means earth, red. Or do you understand that? <laughs> Edom doesn't mean white. It means red. And it doesn't mean red like, oh, my skin is blushing red. It means red like the color of the clay, right? The ground, the word for ground is called Adama. And so Edom and Adama are the same word. And people will make the distinction Oh, he wasn't called Edom because of his skin color. He was called Edom because of the, the bowl of, of porridge that he accepted in exchange for his birthright. But he was described as being red too. So there's a double, uh, there's a double play on words there, a dual word play associated with why he's called red, right? Well, you know, you got people in the community that are named red. You know, you got people in the community that are called Red Bones, right? Red Bone, right? And so he was both red-skinned and he gave up his, his inheritance for some red soup or soup in a red bowl or whatever it was. So this is what we mean by false doctrine to say that somebody who was distinctively described as being black-skinned or brown skinned that somehow now, because we today as black people are oppressed by white people, that somehow now because of this oppression, that this must prophetically be Edom because of the concept of Elohim hating Esau, the concept or the, the, the verse Jacob I have loved but Esau I have hated, right? And so when people come to mind about the difference and about the, the, the conflict between Jacob and Esau, they see a modern conflict and then, you know, attach that this modern conflict to the ancient one. And we've, and we've talked about this before. And again, this is how you know that the doctrine is designed because you're literally one degree <laughs> upon hearing it from disproving it, right? In many different ways, right? You can hear the doctrine and then go directly to the text where it says that Esau was red skinned and he was ruddy and look that up. And that's the same word as Edom, Adam, you know, Admane. Um, and then disprove that straight away. Okay, well, if he's black during the time of Jacob, then I don't see where in history where he's going to change to white. And let's just say you do see in history where he changes to white. Um, someone was saying that, that in the histories that there was a Edomite king of Rome. Well, <laughs> so what? <laughs> that doesn't make, that doesn't make all of Rome 
white and it doesn't make Edom white either, right? And what it means is that you had a black king over brown Rome or light brown Rome, right? And we know that that could happen because didn't you have Barack Obama that was in charge of a white country? Didn't that happen? Isn't that something that happened in your lifetime? <laughs> so now, Barack Obama has, <laughs> because Barack Obama was president of the United States, that means in history, you're going to be able to say, oh, they had one black king. <laughs> that means this must have been some sort of black nation. No, no. It never was, right? America is not a black nation. It's a Gogite nation. And that's where we come to the true identification of who these people are, right? So when you look at when you look at at white people, let's just use white people as a blanket term. You have all these different sorts of white people, right? You've got Germans, you've got French, you've got um, uh, English, you've got Belgium, you've got, you know, uh, Norway, you've got Iceland, you know, you've got Russia, uh, and all these different Eastern European countries, you know, full of white people, Poland, Ukraine, uh, forgive me if I'm forgetting some of these places, Azerbaijan. I met some Azerbaijani folks when I was in Iran, and they're really white, right? They're white folks. So all of these different, and then you have people that look to be mixed, right? Like you've got lots of Arab nations that are very, very, very white, like all of them in Northern Africa. You've got, you know, places like um, Albania, you've got places like Morocco, you've got places where the people that are there just look white, right? I met, um, working at Amazon back in the day, I met a lot, you know, when I'm, you know, coming into this research years back and am talking about it with the people that I meet, I met a lot of people in, um, in Amazon that were from Albania in Northern Africa. And <laughs> when I say that you couldn't tell the difference between them uh, and, you know, Bob from up the street, you know, or, you know, Andy from, you know, from, I don't know, from backwoods, you couldn't. You don't, I mean, they had a, they had dark hair, you know, most of them had dark hair, but they had straight up white skin, right? Straight up white skin. Um, and, you know, they would show me their IDs and their passports and all, you know, and on their IDs from their homeland, it would read white, right? It would say that they were African, but white. So these people were Africans and you wouldn't, you would never say, oh, you're an African, but that's what they were. They had been in Africa for generations, right? So they were Africans. And so how did they get there? Who are they? Where did they come from? Right? Because what happened in Northern Africa happened in Europe and happened in the Levant, the Middle East. And it changed the racial makeup of the entire world. And so you guys have to go back and do this research. And you got to do this research, you know, with a pure heart. Because the false doctrine, you know, that white people are, are Edom is one thing. But when you say that white people are Gog, Magog, that's a whole worse thing. And uh, this is what I was talking about earlier. Um, I think it was yesterday that, you know, being called an Edomite sounds really bad, right? Because it says Esau, I have hated. Sounds like, you know, Elohim hates these people, right? And so that's something easy to point the finger at. Ah, you're an Edomite, you know, Elohim hates you, right? And it's the false doctrine we recognize that we can dismiss it 
you know, off the bat. But the truth is kind of worse that, you know, white people are not Edom, they're Gog, you know, the group of people that Satan has chosen at the end of the world, right? That Satan literally goes and gathers this group of people at the end of the world after the millennium. And this group of people is called Gog Magog, right? And there's some distinction between, hey, is this two different groups of people or a person from Magog, right? This land called Magog. And so it, the, the, the truth is that you kind of got both. You've got Gog and the families of Gog, and then you've got Magog, the surrounding area, and those, those families too. So you do still have, even though Magog is a place and Gog is a person, you still have two different groups of people who coalesce in this, you know, region in the Northeast and then, you know, inflict havoc upon the rest of the world. So let's go over this a little bit. So the big thing that was coming up um, and I think that I went over this really already. I'm already 20 minutes in and I haven't even got to the point that I want to talk about yet. Um, but we're getting there. So the big thing that has been going on in the news lately is that um, the state of Israel has retaliated against the state of Iran. And you'll see videos, you know, online saying, uh-oh, Esau versus the Medes and the Persians. Oh, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to be sarcastic or, you know, any of that. <laughs> because people really, some people really believe this. I doubt that the content creators themselves believe it because it's pushed. And the, you know, the doctrine behind it is a ready-made doctrine for people to just fall into. Um, but what I do believe is, well, no, I, I talked about what I believe. Uh, what I believe is that this doctrine was manufactured by the government in order to hide the end time trueness of who these people really are, right? You can, you can understand that if these people are Gog, <laughs> then it would behoove them to make you believe that they were somebody else, right? So if the Ashkenazim pretended to be Israel in order to gain an inheritance in Israel and thus a foothold in controlling the world, which is what they did, then if you find out that they're not Israel, then you don't point yourself out to be Gog because that means, uh-oh, it's the end of the world and these specific things are going to be happening. No, you want to have a scapegoat um, people group that don't have a bunch of end time prophecies concerning them, right? Therefore, hey, we are Edom. Therefore, hey, if we can't be Israel, then let's just be his brother. Right. <laughs> it's equally absurd to say, OK, well, since we're since you found out that we're not Israel, we'll just insert this false doctrine to make y'all believe that we're his brother. Right. That means that we're still Hebrews and that the, you know, the blessing still falls on them. Do you understand what I'm saying? All the descendants of Abraham are blessed. Right. They're blessed. And so then being denoted as an Edomite is not as much, is not as egregious as it sounds, right? Edom is still better than Gog, right? Because the associated prophecies with Gog are very terrible, that they will be destroyed and wiped out at the end of the world in some spectacular fashion, right? But before then, they do the most 
They do the most damage to Israel. They control the world and they gather the armies of the world together with them to form one giant army, right? And so what we literally see in this time that we live in right now, so let's, let's just back it up and let's get to where we are right now. So we've talked about this before. Um, the people that are in Persia right now, the Iranians are, you know, even the term Iran is really, <laughs> is really a word that comes from the word Aryan. And so the Aryans were a people that invaded Persia, you know, and I can't give you the exact time period, but it was, it was an early time period, but not early enough for them to be the Persians themselves, right? This will be after, this will be after the Medes and the Persians ruled the world, right? When their line began, began to be di uh, diluted um, by this alternate people group that was calling itself, itself the Aryans. And if you look up who these Aryans are, you can see who they believe they are today, the white race of people, and that's who they were back then too. And if you look up the ancient Persians, you'll see they've got big, thick mustaches and black skin, right? Big, thick mustaches, black hair, black skin. The ancient Persians were a black race of people. They look a lot like the Indians we see today. I believe that's who they are. I believe the ancient Persians, the actual ancient Persians, were forced south by the Aryans. And when the Aryans took control of Persia, they called themselves Aryan, Iran, and became ancient Persia and new Iran, right? That's who they are. And so at a point in time in history, this strange group of people emerged from nowhere and changed the racial dynamic of Persia. So after that, <clears throat> after those successes, you have a bunch of other Japhethite clans that come out from the Northeast, from the steppe region, the Caucasus Mountains, and began to conquer and change the racial dynamic of the world. You have the people called Rus that went down into Russia and made Russia white. You had the Huns and the Mongols, which went into China. Did you know that China had a very dark culture too? Black skin, knotty hair, all that. But the Mongols and the Huns, the, you know, Genghis Khan and all of them, changed the racial makeup of China, right? way, way, way back in the day. You then have the Vikings, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, which came down the same group of people still from the Northeast who emerged at the turn of the millennia about two millennia ago and began to, to conquer all around the Mediterranean from Greece to Spain, to Algeria. Did I say Albania? I meant Algeria. This is Algeria that I meant. Y'all don't get me if I said Albania and Albania is in Europe and Algeria is in North Africa. I'm talking about Algeria. Um, <clears throat> Algeria, you know, Morocco, Libya, Egypt, they began to conquer all those places and change those people white. Change not the people themselves, but the racial dynamic of the places where they are, right? And so they began to push the actual Libyans, who were the people called Put, Foot, push them south. Uh, the actual Moroccans, the actual North Africans, the Berbers, right? the people that were descendants from Abraham in North Africa, which we all know Abraham had a second wife. And from that second wife, 
uh, not Hagar and not Sarah, but Keturah. From Keturah, uh, Abraham had like six sons and those six sons uh, fought in North Africa and conquered North Africa. And we can look back at the history of North Africa and of course, North Africa is black. This is where Hannibal comes from. Hannibal being black, Hannibal, Hannibal being a Hebrew word. Hannibal means the favor of the Lord. Not the Lord Elohim, Yao, but the Lord Baal, the false deity, right? This is where Hannibal comes from. He's, you know, a Hebrew, not an Israelite, but a Hebrew, because Abraham was a Hebrew. And so what happened to all of those people? What happened to all those black folks in North Africa? They got conquered and pushed south. They got conquered and pushed south. And now all those people are, you know, mixed up here where I'm at now in West Africa. From West Africa on east and south, you've got the descendants of Ham and then you've got the descendants of Shem all pushed down in here very clearly. Well, we know this because where else were we going to go, you know, um, south, right? Because here we go with um, the fall of Jerusalem. You have, you know, millions of Israelites going down into Egypt. You have millions of Israelites being spread out as slaves all through the Roman Empire, which means places like France, places like England, places like Germany, places like Spain, places like Portugal places like Rome had a very, 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 very large population of Hebrews, of black folks, right? You can look at the writings of Paul. All the places where Paul went, there were synagogues there and not new synagogues. There were old synagogues that were there and large populations of Jewish people. He went to Corinth. He went to Ephesus. He went to Colossae. These are all Greco-Roman cities in, you know, Macedonia and Galatia and Bithynia and all of these different areas, you know, in, in Europe and in Turkey. Um, but all those black people are gone now because of Gog, you know, because of Gog, because Gog are the Goths. The, the term goth and gothic is actually gog, is literally gog, right? And that's why we see people with a different racial characteristic than the ancients in these lands now. You can see a modern depiction of what happened to the rest of the world if you look at America. If you look at the racial dynamics of America, what happened to America? Why was America dark-skinned 500 years ago and now is white-skinned? Why was Canada dark-skinned 500 years ago and now is white-skinned? Because those people, those men that had invaded England so many years earlier, had invaded Europe so many years earlier, kept going and kept invading and kept changing the racial landscapes of all of these different places. <clears throat> and you'll have to notice with America, there wasn't a whole lot of mixture and interbreeding that was going on between the two people groups that first met each other when you know the Europeans colonized America. No, it was more like murder and mayhem that the people that came were the descendants of the Vikings. The people that came were the descendants of the Goths. The people that came were these barbarian tribes that did not care about killing people and taking over their land and taking over their heritage. These were the ancestors of the Gothic hordes, the Gogite hordes. They all came from the Northeast from the same area and went South and West. One of those groups was called the Khazars. It was a million man country that existed in guess where? Ukraine. Ukraine is where their base of operations was. 
and the capital of ancient Khazaria, if I'm not mistaken, was either Kiev or Crimea, right? One of those places, I believe it was Crimea. Um, of course, a place that, you know, a few years ago was under great contention from Ukraine and Russia, the war. But of course, we know that both of these groups are just groups of different Gagite clans that don't mind fighting one another to gain political and military unity, right? Because after Ukraine, <laughs> Russia is over, you're going to have one nation. And they're both going to be one nation under Gog. One nation under Gog, right? That's why you have Iran, China, Russia cooperating because they're all Gagai armies, right? They're all different tribes of Gog. And you can say, okay, well, why do these different tribes look so different? Like the Iranians are light-skinned, but they look different from the Chinese. The Chinese are light-skinned and they look different from the Russians. But if you go back, the Chinese and the Russians have a common ancestor, the Mongols, right? They are <laughs> both coming from, you know, Mongoloid nations, right? The same thing with the Iranians, right? Same thing with the Khazarians, who are the modern-day Ashkenazi Jews. They have the same genetic background. And so here was the thing about these Algerians, and I believe it was Algerian, um, the guys that I work with at, at Amazon. And I have to make sure that I get the country correct because I don't want to do these people any disservice. They call themselves Andaluvians or something like that. There was another name that they called themselves, a more ancient name that they had for themselves. Um, but I had a buddy. Uh, and here's the thing. They were all Muslims, too. There was, these are just a gang of white Muslims, lily white Muslims. Um, and I had a buddy who was a Sudanese guy, and he's, of course, black, right? Um, and he's a Muslim, too. So they would all kind of get together and have their, you know, debate and their, um, you know, their talking points together um, to go against me. It's just the same thing as the Christians would do the same thing. And, you know, to have something to say against what I was saying. Um, and so there was a, like a weird dynamic between the Sudanese guy and the Algerian guys, because there was a bunch of Algerian guys, um, because they were clearly white and he was clearly black, right? And he would, you know, agree with them on a religious level, but on a, um, on a racial level or a, a, a connection type of, you know, connected, you know, culturally, maybe you should say, or, or deeper connection, he connected with me because we're both clearly black people. And what he went, went ahead and told me was, is that he said, hey, all these guys, and they'll never tell you this, but they did DNA tests on themselves. And since we're Muslims, you know, <laughs> he... Uh, they, you know, let me see some of their DNA results and it came back German. It came back German. And he had a big laugh about it. Um, but historically, I mean, it's there. It's for sure there that, that the, the nation of Gog, Magog, split into a bunch of different factions and each of these factions did the same thing, that they invaded the places where they were, either killed or drove out the regular inhabitants. And then the history that was in that place, they took over and claimed to be of that place, right? Um, you have that going on every single place where they were. Do you understand that the Gothic tribes, the Gogite tribes, conquered Rome in about 400 AD, 450 AD, conquered Rome and then didn't go anywhere. Well, what they did 
was they merged and pushed the actual Romans out. And then they took over claim to Rome and pretended themselves to be Roman. They did the same thing in the East and set up another franchise of Roman history. They did the same thing in Germany and created the, what is it called? The Roman, uh, oh my goodness. It was called the Roman something or other in Germany. But it didn't have anything to do with anything Roman, even though they called themselves Romans, right? Um, but it was a whole nation of people that called themselves Romans, and they were in Germany. They did the same thing in England. They killed, wiped out, pushed west all the black folks that were in England, the leftover slaves from the Roman Empire, pushed them all south and west, pushed people out of France, pushed people out of Germany, pushed people out of England, and then they became themselves the English, the Anglo-Saxons, the, the, uh, all of the Lombards, and I've been doing some of this research, uh, the Normans, all of these different Gogite tribes just set up shop where they were and pretended to be the ancient people that were there. They pretended to be those people and they merged whatever knowledge that they had from the people that were there with their own histories and created a new history. And you'll see that all this happened between the years of 450 AD to 1000 AD. And in 1000 AD, they began to conquer and rule that all you had in the ruling structures about 12, 13, 14 AD were Gagite clans. And not just any old Gagite clans by this time. By this time, they had conquered the wealth of the world and had become rich. And even though they were, you know, struggling for which Gagite clan was going to be in charge, they recognized that they were all Gagite clans, right? That some of them had adopted Judaism, that some of them had adopted Islam that some of them had adopted um, Christianity, but they were all Gagite. And in history, they worked together in order to change the racial makeup of history. This is why you have the Jews being kicked out of all of these different nations. This is why you have the Spanish Inquisition, which was really meant to rid Europe of black people. That's all it was and then hide it in history that's why you have people being sent to west africa because they knew or jews sent to west africa because they knew that once we got there that we would just fall in among the all the other black people that were there the ancient egyptians the ancient you know kushites the ancient edomites who were around there the ancient people groups, the ancient Assyrians, the ancient Persians, anything ancient being pushed south to be able to change who they were and where they were, right? And so we mixed in with that group. We didn't mix, you know, families or anything, but we were there. And to the outsider looking in, the European outsider looking in, you couldn't tell the difference, right? In fact, in Rome, they could never tell the difference between an Ethiopian, an Egyptian, and a Jew. They were all mistaken for the same thing. Tacitus even says that, hey, uh, we believe that the Jews are Egyptians and that the Egyptians are Ethiopians, right? And so if you believe that the Egyptians are Ethiopians, Ethiopia means land of black. So the Egyptians have to be black. And if you think the Jews are the Egyptians, then they have to be that too. In fact, double, double in fact, times two in fact, Josephus points out the history of Jacob and names all the sons and all their sons and, and on down the lineage for the expressed purpose as to distinguish their lineage and their line from Egyptians. As he says in his ancient histories, in his antiquities, 
that most people believe we are Egyptians. I am taking the time, this is literally what he says, I am taking the time to write down all these names of all of the, these different people in order to distinguish us in, in genealogy from Egypt so nobody is confused anymore. Because this, you know, Josephus and Tacitus are around at the same time. Tacitus is a proof that people believe that Jews were Egyptians. And Josephus backs that proof up by saying, hey, all these people out here believe that we're Egyptians. This is why we're not. They'll look at the family. This is why we're not Egyptians. But it goes a long way to say the makeup of of black folks back in the day. And here's the crazy part about Tacitus. Tacitus is so confused as to say, hey, the Jews may even be <laughs> Romans. That's why you know that the Romans were very dark skinned because how in the world are you gonna include yourself in a group that comes from the Egyptians? in a group that comes from the Ethiopians. If you include yourself in that group and you're lily white with, with blue eyes and blonde hair, there is no way that anybody would take you serious. But if you look like a Spanish person, like a, not a Spanish Spanish person, because they look very white, but a Mexican person or a South American person, if you're that complexion or an Indian person, if you're of that makeup, then it's not difficult to say, oh, okay, well, this person at some point in time in history must have been of darker complexion and could have come from, you know, these dark complected people that we see today, like the Jews and the, and the Egyptians and the Ethiopians. You know, he mentions, you know, that lineage as being last and the most distant, but he does mention it and say, hey, he, they might even be family to us, even though he's wrong. Because the, <laughs> the, the people that he's saying are their ancient ancestors and our ancient ancestors aren't our ancient ancestors, it's just theirs. But it just shows you that they were dark-skinned people too, right? And so when we look at history, we have a very scary thing that we see in history that you have a group of people to emerge out of nowhere and change the world, change the way the world looks at the world, change the way the world looks at the future, change the way the world looks at history. You have right now a Gog Magog world where all the major players in the world are Gog and Magog clans. Russia is a Gog Magog clan. Iran is a Gog Magog clan. Israel is a Gog Magog clan. False Israel is in Israel today. Palestine, are uh, they're related to Israel. They're Gog and Magog too. England, Gog Magog. Germany, Gog Magog. France, Gog Magog. The United States, Gog Magog. Canada, Gog Magog. Gog and Magog Gog, have conquered all of these different lands and enslaved all the actual native peoples of those lands, enslaved them or killed them. This is the nature of reality today. And I have to make a disclaimer that this is not meant to be racist or bigoted or prejudiced in any way. This is just an accurate analysis of ancient and modern history. There is no other conclusion that you can come to. You cannot even distinguish literally where the characteristics of white skin, blue eyes, blonde hair emerge from, whether it was because people lived in caves for 2,000 years and then developed um, hypersensitivity in their eyes and in their hair and in their instincts, and that's why they're predatory people, or for some other reason. We have no idea why the people look the way they do and behave the way they do. We just see historically that they do. And I'm not here to, to elaborate 
or to go back and forth on why this is and where they come from. I'm just here to identify. And identification is the most important thing because that shows you where you are in prophecy. Uh-oh, if you see Gog and Magog popping up out of nowhere, you better start reading Ezekiel and you better start reading Revelation. There is a group of Gog and Magog that exists before the thousand years and there is a regathering of them after the thousand years. Because remember it says in Revelation 20 that Satan will be loosed again to regather the armies of the nations and then they just casually put in there Gog and Magog as the armies of the nations, right? And so do we see an army of nations today gathering themselves together in war and peace, in harmony and in disarray, working together like, you know, feet of iron and mirrored clay? We do. That be Gog and them. That be Gog and them. And it's a strange reality that we live in, but it's attested to in prophecy so well that the people that are designing these false doctrines like, oh, the Ashkenaz are really Edom, even though they call themselves Ashkenaz, which is a cousin of God. <laughs> um, oh, that they're Edomites and they really are our, our brother. And there's even a Torah verse that says, don't hate them. Do you see what I'm saying? That this is like the play for the future to say, oh, well, we're not supposed to be hating the Eve. If they're not Israel and they're Edom, then we're supposed to really not hate them anyway, right? And we're not supposed to hate them already, not supposed to hate them, because the position that we're in is prophesied, and we put ourselves in that position. So the hatred has to fall back on your fleshly self, because it's your flesh and your father's flesh and his father's flesh that got you here in the first place. So you can't be necessarily hating nobody, for one. And for two, you're going to have Gogite people that are in the congregation, no doubt about it. Now, I do think these people are going to be the hardest people to come to the conclusion of the truth. Because you have to... And I was talking about this the other day, too, right? Because the people that are Gog and Magog... Like, not the people at the top. They know they're God and may God. Do you know George Bush? <laughs> and this is the wild part. And we're about at an hour here. And this is crazy to be at an hour talking about this. But do you know George Bush? You guys know George Bush was like secret agent number one. He was top spy you know, for forever, right? George Bush was like, you know, the greatest spy that you never know about. And this is how good of a spy he was, because you don't even know he's a spy. He's a president, right? He's a former president. But he was a top spy. He was like James Bond, right? And in the worst way, because you guys don't understand that the spy agencies, the secret agents that they make so cool on look on look so cool on TV are the worst people in the world because they're satanic. They're the the spy secret agency is secret because the secret is they worship Satan, right? And Satan is all about killing the Jews, the actual Jews, and that, that'd be us, right? So the job of George Bush was to implement holocausts everywhere he went. And the first holocaust that he implemented was in the 1980s with the crack era, right? If this, that was George Bush's baby. George Bush is responsible for killing, imprisoning, and um, poisoning millions of black people in America. That was his secret agent mission. You guys don't understand that the secret agents are evil and they're secret because the secret is the devil. And they implement all these satanic tactics and programs onto you. That's what it's all about. That's what the CIA is. That's what the FBI is. That's what the DEA is. And all of the ATF, all of these different three-letter groups are satanic cults. And they're run by secret agents that go undercover as politicians, go undercover as lawyers, go undercover as presidents. Did you know that President Bush was president for 12 years? 
as you can't have the spy master, <laughs> you know, because he was uh, Ronald Reagan's vice president in the 80s. You can't have a spy master and then a senile president, a sp uh, spy master vice president and a senile president. No, you've got the vice president that's the spy master as the president for those eight years during Reagan, during the Reagan administration. And then he comes out and does another four years on his own, you know, presidency, you know, as a cap, as a cherry on top. So George Bush was president clearly for 12 years. Um, but besides all that, that's just, you know, like a tangent, you know, that George Bush was joined into a secret society called Skull and Bones, right? And so I've got this in American Jew 3, but guess what his spy name was? That all of them, when they join um, Skull and Bones, they have to have this nickname that they go by, that they're called during their initiation process. And then that's their name going forward among this secret group. Guess what his secret name was, y'all? Magog. <laughs> George Bush's secret satanic spy name was Magog. And he did Magog-ish things. He set up, he conquered everywhere he went. He destroyed black people everywhere he went. Especially, primarily in America and went all over the world to make that happen. Now, George Bush knew he was Gog. George Bush knew he was a Magog clan, right? He was a Magog clansman. And he initiated all the programs that, that his forefathers initiated before him to wipe out history, to wipe out the people that held the history, and to rewrite it in his own image. And he was successful at it and died in a ripe old age. Is he dead? I believe he is. Died at a ripe old age. You understand what I'm saying? This is the nature of your reality. And there's no getting around it. It's not racist. It's not bigoted. It's not prejudiced in any way. It is an honest and open analysis of scripture and history and prophecy all combined into one that fits like a glove, y'all. It fits like a glove. It's a scary, scary thing because not only did they invade, they invade, invaded and changed history when they did it. And it's prophetic, right? That's the reason why they can't tell you they're Gog because they can't tell you the game plan. They can't let you know that Gog and Goth are the same thing. That if they come from these Gothic Germanic tribes, they're saying to you that they're Gog. They have to change their name. They have to make sure that they present to you Goth and not Gog, or you'll put it together. Oh, and here's the thing. Here's the wild part about it. This is what I was about to go into before. Imagine, because see, we always look at things from our perspective. I've got a song where I where I talk about imagine finding that you're finding out that your granddad is David, you know, king of Israel, that your great, great, great distant ancestor is David and how amazing you would feel at that. This is, you know, the feeling of Israelites in America, actual Israelites in America, you know, black folks or who they called Negroes that are actually Judites, Israelites, right? Yahudi, right? So that feeling that you get from understanding why that you're oppressed in the way that you're oppressed, understanding why that your people live in concentration camps, the projects in America. I didn't know that there were 60 projects in Brooklyn. 60? It's crazy. It's like a, it's like a concentration city, concentration camp city in Brooklyn. 60 projects. It's terrible. So... Imagine finding out that your granddad is David is the most remarkable thing that could happen in your life. Imagine knowing that the people, the, the person that the entire world follows right now, you know, Yahusha, who they call Jesus, is actually not Jesus, but from your same tribe, you know, that your ancestors would have been around him 
Do you see what I'm saying? That your ancestor would have even been related because you've got Mary in there, right? Th this is the incredible thing that you wake up to in all this oppression and depression. Like, why, why, why is this happening to me? Now you know, right? Oh, and it makes sense. And hallelujah, because here we are, right? So you got that concept of waking up to find out that your granddad is David, right? Well, think of it on the flip side, right? For white folks, imagine waking up to know that your granddad is Gog. How scary is that? Imagine waking up and finding out that you are on the other side and that Satan chose your people. How much of a nightmare would that be? You've seen the scripture where the Gentiles wake up and realize that, that they inherited lies. Our fathers have inherited lies. Not even them, their fathers inherited the lies. Imagine waking up to that reality while you have believed that you're on top of the world and that you're the pinnacle of human civilization for your entire life, that people are all striving to get to your country, to experience your freedom, to get your knowledge, to go to the stars like y'all did, and waking up and finding out that none of that stuff is actually true and that you come from a people that Satan chose to deceive the world. Imagine that nightmare. That's how tough it's going to be for Gentiles to be into the kingdom, for this particular type of Gentile to be into the kingdom, the Gogite Gentiles, right? But regardless of all that, that it's going to happen because it says all nations, right? The scripture says all nations are going to be there. Not everybody from all nations, but a remnant of the saved nations will be there. So there's got to be some Gogites that are going to be there too. And so you can't discriminate or distinguish or be a respecter of persons, even in the era of deception that we live in now, because you never know who's beside you. You never know that you may have, you know, the white, you know, friend or the Gogite friend that is closer to you than your Hebrew brother. Do you understand that accepts you quicker than he would or does? Do you see what I'm saying? That that could be the reality of the situation. Because the scripture says, you know, that there are some of those people that are going to have greater names than sons and daughters, right? And so we don't want to even appear to be respecter of persons, right? We don't want to appear to be that way. But we do still want to accurately identify the signs of the times, and so here's the thing. If you look at the Old Testament and the New Testament and you're looking at it like, oh, well, these prophecies don't apply to me. How does this relate to me in my regular life? I don't understand any of this stuff. Bet you if you know that Gog is in charge, you'll understand it then. Oh, well, that does make sense. That makes sense that Gog comes out of Europe. Gog is meant to buy Satan. <laughs> enslave the peoples of the world and that's what's happening in fact Gog seems to be specifically going after us and now we know why now we know why there was an and here's the other thing and I'm going to say this and close out we say hallelujah for understanding prophecy and being able to see what's what and who's who because it's so important so that you don't get confused and tricked in the last days. Like these Israelite pastors are trying to do to y'all. Don't get caught up in the smooth talking Israelite pastors either. Because you've got Christian pastors and you've got Israelite pastors too. And they both leading people into the ditch. They both are. So you got to be careful out there, you guys. You don't want to just grab up any old teacher and say, oh, okay, well, this is my teacher. I'm going to believe and follow everything that he's saying. Now you got to seek it out yourself for sure. So some more ancient history to kind of put a put an exclamation point on the end of what we're talking about here so that you can kind of see the trueness of what we're saying um so there's these you know what's become romanticized and i don't mean to say romanticized as having anything to do with romans this is pre-roman that have been you know mythologized um there's these writings called the writings the romances of alexander 
right? Alexander the Great, the Macedonian who ruled the world, right? Again, we talk about Macedonians, Greeks, not being white, right? And so this is how we know. So what Alexander did, and uh, this has become etched in mythology as well, because this is what they want. Um, what Alexander the Great did was build an iron wall. And forgive me if I can't remember exactly where the wall was. I, I'm not even going to speculate where it was, but just you do the research. So he built this giant iron wall. And it was for the expressed purpose. This is Alexander the Great. This is stuff that you don't hear about. There's a lot of stuff that you won't hear about about Alexander the Great that has to do with the Bible because they don't want you to put history and biblical history together and make one single story because it'll point them out as being the Gorgites, right? And so what Alexander the Great did, he's a Greek, he's not a Roman, so but still not white. He built a giant wall made of iron. And for the express purpose, and this is even in history going forward, for the expressed purpose to keep out Gog and Magog. And guess what he calls them? He doesn't call them Gog and Magog. He calls them Goth and Magoth. And this is where we get the term Goth from. Not because it's what they called themselves. They called themselves Gog. Right? And so Alexander the Great built a great wall like the people in China to keep out the hordes of Gogites, some of whom were giant, some of whom, lots of whom were murderous barbarians, is what they were even called, murderous barbarians, who were coming and destroying, sweeping across these large, vast plains of areas and devouring everything in their path. Why do you think there was a great wall in China? Haven't you heard that the great wall was built to keep giants out? Well, the giants won. The giants got over the wall and changed the makeup of China. The giants got over the wall wherever Alexander the Great built, you know, because he ruled the world, so he could have built it anywhere. They got over it then, too. Do you know in London, in Central City, London, the square mile that owns all of Europe, the, the richest square mile in the world, next to the Vatican City? And you, we know from Empire of the City, that documentary that came out, uh, conspiracy documentary with a lot of crazy stuff in it that you don't even want to fool with. But from that documentary, we see that there are three cities, Washington, D.C., um, Vatican City, and the London inner city, which act as a single country. But they're only just really small inside cities that, that don't have the same rules. Washington, D.C. is not a state. It's, it's like a district. And it has different rules and a different setup from the rest of the country, right? It's its own thing. Same thing for Vatican City, same thing for Central City London, and they work in accordance. In Central City London, they have a Gog Magog parade every year where they put up these, these pinatas, these big, huge, tall pinata floats that are Gog and Magog, that are two giants that they parade down the street in Central City London because they know who they are, they, at least those people. Um, but the, the normal Gentiles, the ones that aren't rich and powerful, but that are still Gog, will wake up and find out who they are. And they'll say to themselves, doggone it, my father's inherited lies. Exactly like the Bible says, right? Because if you're able to accurately identify, the story is laid out in front of you pretty plain. Okay, guys. All right. We are at a minute, uh, uh, an hour and 10 minutes right now, and it's entirely too long to be talking about this without evidence to just show you. Do you see what I'm saying? So I could, you know, point and show you all these things are true. I always try to freestyle these videos to kind of, you know, make them organic and to make them palatable. Um, but I'm going to make a video about this. I'm actually going to do American Jew 4 Gog World Order. I don't know what it's called yet, Gog, Magog, World War, 
Gog World Order, The Rise of Gog, all of these different titles. I don't know which one I'm going to use, but this is definitely what it's going to be about because there's too much false information out there for me to just sit on and not have something to say, right? And not have some sort of truth to insert into the discussion. With all of this falseness walking around, all, all you know, existing. All of my people believe in this, this falsehood. Got to do something about it. Got to put out a video. Even if it doesn't make an impact, you know, on lots of different people, I have it as an instructional tool to go back to and say, okay, well, look at this video. If you want to understand what's going on today and how it relates to prophecy and who's this person and who's that person, who you are and who they are, and so that you can have an accurate representation of what's going on. Not so that you can hate that other person. Not so that you can go around calling people Gog, Magog. Oh, you a Gog anyway. You're, you know, chosen by the devil and are destined to rest where the devil rests. Not for that reason at all, but for the reason to understand where you are in prophecy and what you need to do about it, right? What you need to do in righteousness about it, right? Okay, you guys. Shalom, shalom.